the irony of what you've brought up there is either way you have to take a medication, whether it's yeah. the evils of ACE inhibitors or androtensin receptor blockers. But then, God forbid, you say the word AI to control the estrogen <laughs> to manage the blood pressure. So the irony is you end up taking a medication either way. If you're going to control your estrogen, you're going to have more of a global effect over other parameters like mental health, blood pressure, fat deposition, anabolism, anabolism physical appearance, moods, <laughs> just keep going on and on. That. I mean, unless you're transitioning, I don't know why you'd want your estrogen so high. And then we have like a slew of medical interventions. We have the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers and the calcium channel blockers and the beta blockers. Now there's like 10 or 15 of each in each category. Um, I don't think we need to address all of them. I think we should address the one that are either commonly used or has some unique characteristics. Back in the day, lisinopril was pretty popular as a blood pressure medication. Um, it got the job done. It was the only thing that people really ran because it was readily available, but people would get a dry cough, right? That's why people kind of went away from lisinopril and moved over to telmosartan. Um, and then there's, the only ki there's kidney and liver risk with it too. Oh, with lisinopril? Yeah. I mean, okay. not common, but it, it is a, like, and that's with, why I meant with, it's versus the natural stuff. You're not running into the risk of yeah, like, organ with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, if, if you have chronic kidney disease undiagnosed, yeah. then it's not a good idea. You can't, you can't. Yeah, like them. I can't and, use any of those drugs. All ah, right. Yeah, of course, because you only have one kidney. And um, there's some, you know, very low risk that it might actually cause issues with your kidneys. And that's documented with most um, ACE inhibitors mm -hmm. and ARBs. Um, again, it's a rare risk, but it's not unheard of. Now, enalopril might still have some merit here and there because it's secondary unique characteristics that it controls hematocrit and a red blood cell count. So for the guys who have undiagnosed sleep apnea and use a boatload of EQ and anadrol, uh, that might be some benefit there right, to keep their hematocrit in range. So if you have to go with the blood pressure medication and hematocrit and red blood cell count is high, and again, you're worried about that. Uh, then anatopril, 2.5 milligrams, 5 milligrams might be eight tier um, because you get two beneficial effects, blood pressure management and hematocrit control. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a million different ways to control your hematocrit, um, but we'll save that for another tier list. Yeah, we could do a whole lot on blood because I think <laughs> yeah, we, people misunderstand exactly. that whole. Right, exactly. Yeah, and it, it's but, good um, to, to do a reminder on that. But people are still worried about it. And again, you have the reference range. Not everybody understands the difference in hydration and platelets. And, well, and, you know, and also f and ferritin, how that comes into play. Exactly. The, right. the, so, the things we'll people are that. not looking at. We do that another time. But the, uh, the nanoprol also has risk of kidney disease. Exactly. Kidney yeah. damage yeah. as well. So they all, yeah. you know. So regarding the kidney damage and, and knowing that there's so many other compounds on the market. Do ACE inhibitors still have a merit I, if needed? Or are we now pivoting more to ARBs? I would go with option B. Yeah, no, well, again, we will we can share this from that uh, recommendation guideline, but they are moving away from ACE inhibitors being the first line mm -hmm. that you start with an A or B, and then if you need combo therapy, you pick your second choice is either lowering the ACE inhibition, so you inhibit the ACE enzyme, or you use a calcium channel blocker, which then has other right. side effects as well. Yeah, but A or Bs are the, the first line now from a, a medical intervention that should be prescribed mm -hmm. to start. Right. And what, what you normally find now in terms of like general population, the most commonly prescribed one is low SART and mm -hmm. is normally what mm -hmm. is generally prescribed to normal people whereas we've sort of fell in line with talmasartan based on its its half-life its drug distribution secondary benefits you know of lowering uh, androtensin 2 uh, activation of the the receptor and all the other antioxidant benefits fat burn and whatever we've pulled out of <laughs> yeah. space but it, it you know it it's the one that we've all favored towards and you know, it's it's nice to see that we're thinking outside of like the medical community and what is more appropriate for our population of people. But like you said, when it within each class within a, a or B is the like the sartan drugs, 
there are, I think there's at least 10 within yeah. the, the angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors. There's at least eight. We, we have a whole host of these drugs and have moved through different generations depending on how they partition in the body, how they're metabolized. Uh, some of them act as pro drugs and then they convert to the active drug in the body. Um, if we were to pick one to start, then I think, yeah, starting at the top and blocking the receptor is a, is a better strategy in that when you block the receptor, you still allow what has been produced, angiotensin 2, to move around the body and activate other angiotensin 2 receptors. So obviously we're, we're getting down into the nitty gritty now, the two different types of receptors that yeah. exist, one being good, one being potentially bad, that you're still allowing activation of the good yeah. receptor. Yeah, Dean and I did a whole video just on that on my yeah. channel mm -hmm. a while ago. Yeah. yeah, I'll link it down below. And specifically why you shouldn't necessarily just be blocking that all the time, right? Because there's good that comes from it as well. Right. And so when we're, we're looking at it, I guess it it's, again, by default, if we're going to choose this medication and we've got blood pressure over, you know, that pre-stage one, like we're at 140 over 90, and you've done all your... You've done all your lifestyle intervention, all the easy things we covered earlier. You go in with the A or B expecting quite a dramatic shift in blood pressure if it is angiotensin driven. And what we're really leaning into here is genetics, genetic expression of ACE2 in the lungs. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, you get into arguments around like everyone should be taking an A or B regardless of their status. And you're, you're disregarding that probably 60% of people don't have an angiotensin 2 um, problem in their genetic line and the other 40% do. And then the other 40% epigenetically from taking high doses of androgens are influencing that RAS pathway. Mm -hmm. that yeah, uh, people completely neglect the mineral corticoid receptor activation where the, the, the electrolyte balance is altered, which you can easily manipulate with dietary interventions yeah. <laughs> like yeah. if, you, if you let's say let's say let's say you're on a good stack right of steroids for anabolism off-season contest prep is it the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that really gets fucked or the mineral or the corticoid receptor pathway i would say the second the second probably depending on the yeah. drugs but more the yeah second. depending on the drugs right but in in, in a stack you know, of, of a couple of different compounds really aimed towards anabolism, I would say that the mineral corticoids and, and the, the balance that you change regarding your electrolytes, which could have a negative effect on your blood pressure, and again, burning through magnesium and, and, and you know, faster than usual because you have so much skeletal muscle contractions, and, and losing the sodium and potassium because your dietary changes, I think that's more of an issue with bodybuilders than in rain and angiotensin and aldosterone system. People understand that they need to control their estrogen levels unless... Do they understand that? Unless there's a guy out there telling you to increase your estrogen levels, it does have a negative effect on your rain and angiotensin aldosterone system, and then prescribe a medication yeah. that can modulate that. Interesting. Like somebody has an agenda. Interesting. <sighs> anyway, hmm. anyway. Either or way, you know, <laughs> the, iron, the irony of what you brought up there is either way you have to take a medication, whether it's yeah. the evils of... ACE, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, which they're not mm. evil, but then God forbid you say the word AI to control the estrogen <laughs> to manage the blood pressure. So yeah, the, ir the irony is you end up taking the medication either way. And you're, you're probably, I'm not going to say have less risk, but if you're going to control your estrogen, you're going to have more of a global effect over other parameters like mental health, blood pressure, Fat deposition, anabolism. Fi anabolism, physical appearance, moods, <laughs> just keep going on and on. Uh, I mean, unless you're transitioning, I don't know why you'd be your estrogen so high. I will, I, will, I will say one thing. After I did that gyno uh, protocol, right, where I just let my estrogen run wild, mm -hmm. and I think the highest it got to was 225, blood pressure was in range. Yeah, I felt fine, though. I felt fine. Like, I, I might have to double check with my wife if what's crying during particular movies are a little bit overly emotional. Um, mentally, I felt fine. Um, where was it going? <laughs> this and you were able to achieve a full erection? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was able to achieve a full erection. 
<laughs> was there a serious <laughs> premature ejaculation occur? Yeah, I was able to grow my gyno to like legendary proportions, or even a surgeon was like, uh, bro, I only see these on uh, obese people. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten acne since. Since lowering it. I always had no since since that time. So, and my wife noticed the same thing during her pregnancy, where estrogen was undetectably high. Um, so everybody always um, gives estradiol, and myself included, estradiol or hormonal fluctuations mm -hmm. that that it causes so much mm -hmm. acne. Right? My wife had zero acne during her pregnancy, and now it's slowly coming back. Now that their estrogen levels crashed, I mean that's an estrogen crash from like undetectably high, and it drops ninety percent in three days. Insane. No wonder there's postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and my my I'm, I'm controlling my estradiol levels now, but I had my estradiol high for like four months. Didn't have any acne and haven't had acne since. So there might be something to say in that regard. You know, grow your gyno, get rid of the acne if that's an issue for you. I had one pimple here, so small one. So, but that's the only thing that I noticed. It Maybe it, at one point during time, you could ramp your estrogen really high if you can deal with the side effects. And then uh, if you're acne prone, it might get rid of it. Possibly. I still don't know. Possibly, the yeah. But two, an yeah. anecdotal of two, right? one on steroids, no. one. Pregnant. I would think the risks of the high estrogen would outweigh any zit threat. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, well, that can also cause issues. <laughs> well, we'll address that during the tear list, <laughs> during yeah. the acne tear list. <laughs> it's probably a liver metabolism problem when you look at it, because when you have estradiol, then you have estrone, and then you have the 2 hydroxy, 4 hydroxy, 16, and mm -hmm. then you have the methoxy. Uh, counterparts that COMT methylates. Mm -hmm. I I know from personal experience when my estrogen goes extremely high, and that's just with 125 tomatoes. That with <laughs> <laughs> with with my my mood, my mood completely changes quite quick because mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Genetically, I've said it to you before, Steve, about having a very fast MAO. A enzyme right. that just burns through serotonin. Right. But one of the things that keeps up at serotonin's demand then, or most of estrogen, is methylation. And then you end up with a scenario where you've got high estrogen and now you've got a blockage in your estradiol metabolism because you don't have enough folate metabolism. Right. And I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, but there's times in the past where I've ran like 15 milligrams of metal folate, like max high mm -hmm. clinical depression dosage of metal mm -hmm. folate to break through that methylation barrier while bringing estrogen down. Mm -hmm. That when you have high estrogen, you're putting huge demand on SAMe and your methylation yep. to clear sure. the estrogen as well. So that then causes all sorts of imbalances in your neurochemistry. So it's really important that, like we've said before, it's like Goldilocks, you want just the right amount that it serves your body physically, mentally, and everything else without fluctuating like a sky high. And now all of a sudden you've got blood pressure problems or mood issues or too low and your joints feel like absolute crap. Yeah. And, it, and for most people that seems to be towards the top of the reference range or slightly okay. over it. So we're talking about 35 to 50. Yeah. And then after that, most guys start to get side effects. I was surprised that I was mentally stable and that my acne went away after the high estrogen. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how much the trestolone and the DECA contributed, oh. but you would say that on a, on a stack like that, no AI, like high test, high DECA, high trestolone, estradiol through the roof, that I would be pimpled galore, but that actually went away. So it's mm. counterintuitive, but sometimes shit happens so i'm actually happy that i did this experiment um where were we oh we were talking about tell <laughs> yeah, yeah for <laughs> i guess i guess if we look at let's say someone does have the genetic basis so they have angiotensin 2 issues straight away tell from a tear perspective would be s like it's the most mm -hmm. No. available drug to you and people are going to be shocked dean is recommending telmasartan and s tier somebody's creaming their pants uh, in know. northern thailand <laughs> right now 100 percent. he's going to clip this and see. even <laughs> dean said it was s tier <laughs> does he watch this <laughs> oh trust me dude he watches everything i do so in that instance that is perfectly suited for that case-specific person, which is why I've said all the time from a pharmacology perspective, P 
pick the drug to match the person, not mm -hmm. take the drug just because. So <laughs> <laughs> because you heard it on YouTube, <laughs> yeah, because uh, shit flow in three XYZ said it. <laughs> <laughs> so in in that regard, if if they do have these genetic problems, and and another like side point I've often said is, we have two medications I believe have been developed to address root causes of disease: angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or receptor blockers go towards the genetic aspect of ACE two, and insulin. They're really the only two that yep. mm -hmm. go to the root cause of you've got type 1 diabetes, can't make insulin, here's insulin. Got genetic problems with ACE2? Well, unfortunately, there's nothing we can really do regardless of your dietary intervention and this, that, and the other. You are going to be hypertensive, so we'll block the enzyme or we'll block the receptor yep. to offset. What we covered was the risks of high blood pressure causing disease, not the risk of the high blood pressure itself. Right. And it seems that African Americans have a higher likelihood to have this genetic issue than Caucasians do. Um, you know, yep. so dietary and lifestyle interventions aside, they are probably more likely to end up on a medication like this when they do heavy cycles. I mean, even personally speaking, my dad is. Mm. African. He's from Mauritius, so I'm half African and my mother's Nobody Irish. Nobody would tell you. No, no. no. When, when people see the picture of me and my dad, it's like, geez, man, who's that guy? I still, yeah. have, a, I still have a running joke with a friend who uh, still doesn't believe he's my dad. But anyway. Honestly, I think if you like move countries and you, you expose yourself a little bit to sunlight and not this uh, UK uh, sun that doesn't give anybody a tan, I think you can get dark. I oh, mean, remember dark. last year? Last year when I came back uh, from vacation, I changed species. <laughs> <laughs> I 